Okay. Okay. So, uh, welcome to Vivian, okay, and Thomas Carvalho from Trace. They are your first sort of industrial speakers. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm gonna just start talking about a lot of random things, and I hope they are not super random. But then I'm gonna invite more two colleagues to join me and bring some dedication to you. So we're Trace. We trade, trade, and for transparency for sustainable trade, trade. Uh, and before transparency for sustainable supply chain, but now we're expanding a little bit the scope. So we're actually a project, which is a joint collaboration between Global Canopy in Oxford and Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, not only here in Stockholm, but also in Oxford, we have another Stockholm Environment Institute there. We have other partners, kind of like, I would say everywhere in the world, but it sounds very arrogant. So we have two partners in Brazil, some partners in, in Indonesia, uh, some colleagues working with organizations in, in Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire, and hopefully in the future in Ghana as well. Uh, but we also have colleagues working from California, from the United States, and the United States SCI unit. So what do we do there? What is what is this this project aiming for? Uh, we are in our second year, second second part, which means that we are we had the first five years just creating the scope of what's trace, and then another five years now really delivering the 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 dream that we have of mapping seventy percent of the commodities driving deforestation <laughs> in tropical areas, and then after we have this map, we cover the seventy percent of it. We can move to do other, other uh, challenges that we are already covering, actually. But from where all this idea comes from, so just, just mention the agenda. So we published this paper, and I think it was kind of like three weeks ago, uh, we had this paper published on, on science, which is talking a little bit about uh, what is actually driving deforestation. So deforestation is the main thing for us. We are concerned about supply chain because the food that we are eating, not only the food, like the things that we're eating to toothpaste to actually to, to just brush our teeth is full of palm oil, planted mainly in, in, in Indonesia, driving by the law of deforestation. And now in the world that is quite concerned about climate change. And this is a concern that we all share together because we have nutrient goal with this plant, which is so vital at the end of the day. We really need to stop a little bit of it. Of course, we have a lot of different tissues that sometimes we cannot see them when we're just shopping, just buying things in the grocery store, which is, for example, all the traditional uh, communities that are just removed from their places because of the expansion of monocrops. This, I mean, I'm from Brazil, and this is quite quite common everywhere. It's the type of thing like, you know, it's kind of like a, the Syrian war, almost, you know, in the beginning, it's shocking, and then, uh, you know, seven years of war, eight years of war, and then you stop, stop being so concerned about it. But it's actually our decisions that are really driving that. So I think as people working with data, if we get more aware of this type of thing, we can actually drive new initiatives, not only as consumers, but also as professionals to drive changes on this. So one of the things that are driving deforestation is not only the expansion of commodities, even though 90% to 99% of the deforestation that we see in the world is driven by the expansion of commodities. But it's also a little bit more complicated than that because we have this weird concept between what is a land use and what is a commodity production. So one of the things, and this, this is the, 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 the first one, is actually what is the pasture increase? So pasture, we kind of like connected it directly with the cow production. So for example, you want to eat beef. How many of you are vegetarians here? Vegans? I was forgetting to do this other thing. Uh, how many of you love meat? I try to not include my talk because it wouldn't be a really nice idea to do that. But it's complicated just to link pastures and beef production because we have something called land speculation. And this brings all the discussion about how a lot of interpretation of pasture is actually not really for beef production, but also for people that are making money with land. So my whole family is a family of cattle producers. And after, so I think it was only after I started to work with this, the, the commodity, commodity production, that I realized that my grandfather was making way more money with the land than he was really making money selling animals for slaughterhouses. 
And this is because of the land depreciation. So to approach deforestation, the number, the, the, the volume and diversity of information that you need to have is way bigger than just, oh, you look, you have a pasture here, one, one hectare is, a, is enough for half an animal, and then you can link this to the carcass weight, and then you can convert this to production, and then you can just see how much of the kilograms that you're consuming every month eating beef. I'm not really saying that you should stop to stop deforestation, but the problem is really, really, really more complex than we think. So land speculation is very frequently detected as pasture because it's cheaper to just put some animals there to secure the land for you. So you can save this in an event of a boom of commodity this is gonna cost more land and then you can sell the land. So deforestation is complicated, but there's one thing that we're pretty sure from 90 to 99% of the deforestation is driven by, in the tropical areas is driven by commodity expansion. But it's complicated also to understand who is the, the, the one responsible for that. So we have a lot of different companies that are acting on this. So we have Cardio, Bungi, ADM, Louis Dracos, Trading Soy as the main traders. So everything that you see here is actually 60% of the, co oh, the companies trading 60% of the volume of commodities. But it's not so straightforward. So the challenge for us is really to identify who are the actors, the stakeholders involved on this. And it gets really complicated when you see that not all the supply chain is made by direct suppliers. That's a really complicated stuff. So for example, let's talk a little bit about three different supply chain. We have the soy, and the soy I think is the first one. And in the first one, we have Carajou, which is actually not really covered by the indirect sources. Uh, we have more direct sourcing there, and then we have a little bit of indirect sourcing, but actually this indirect sourcing can be traced to the logistic facility, which means that we kind of know, at least for Cargill, from where it's going to, it's coming to, to, to the port. So you know quite a lot from the port to for the logistic hub, like a silo, a crushing facility, to the port. And you also know a little bit better for this company from what farm is going to this logistic that's going to this port. So it's a little bit more, a little less complicated. But let's talk a little bit about cocoa. We all love chocolate. I'm pretty sure about it. If you raise your hand saying that you don't like chocolate, just don't do it. It's weird. <laughs> so let's talk about chocolate because we all love this in the end of the year. And 70% of the cocoa produced in the entire world is coming from Africa. So you have 70% of the supply chain associated to two countries, Cote d'Ivoire and also uh, Ghana. This is something that really worries the companies and we should all be very worried about it. If you have a climate event and if this extreme event disturbing the supply chain, disrupting the supply chain, or if you have, a, for example, civil wars happening, you have the whole supply chain compromised. And this is a huge impact. And that's why diversifying things quite, quite, actually, acts quite, wise, quite wise in this type of supply chain. But it's important to see also that the configuration of the system producing this commodity is completely different than soy. So what you have there is the, pres the presence of the middleman. The middleman is the guy that like, you produce cocoa, I'm gonna buy a little bit from you. You also produce cocoa, I'm gonna buy a little bit from you. Another cocoa producer, I'm gonna buy from you. And then I get her everything and then I just send this to processment or just to export to all around the world. So for example, Brazil buys quite a lot of cocoa beans to process because we have a fungus since the 80s there disturbing our capacity to produce. But we still need to fill the, 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 the places doing the process. But we also have another one that is quite tricky, which is the beef supply chain. Oh, the beef supply chain is, is a nightmare because it's like the same animal can live in different municipalities and different farms in different municipalities in different states because different uh, realities will actually shape in what part of the system you're specialized. So it's not that trivial to understand what is, uh, a, so how to map a supply chain. And that's how I why I present you what is trace. We have three different, uh, I would say products here, but we actually have the one that we're gonna talk today, which is the supply chain. But we also trace a little bit the relationship between investors, money, banks, investing in this commodity driving tropical, tropical deforestation. And we have the insights page, where we actually process all this information to just bring a little bit more clarity on the impact of the supply chains. But let's talk very briefly on how we map this supply chain. We have two different parts of the process. We have one that we, we kind of like to call this the, the, the data-driven part of the, the, the process, and we also have the model-driven part of the process. 
The data driven is the one that we buy. We buy lots and lots of information. So don't think that we're mapping everything. We don't, we're not genius, you know, saying with the Aladdin thing, definitely not. So we know quite a lot about the, com the countries buying and trading with importers and exporters. But we need to connect that with other information and we have a huge diversity of information. So we have, for example, what are the ports? Sometimes from the per shipment data, which is custom declarations of use of lading. And we also have the map of facilities, or we try to map the facilities in the country. So all the things that I was discussing here with you, for example, the location of silos, we try to match this with the companies that are trading in same in two specific countries. So for example, Sweden buying soy. Or even better than that, like we have some kind of like rules, some kind of like information that can help us to identify things. So for example, for Arab countries, for countries where we have a huge, like a big Muslim community, we have some things, for example, the habilitation of halal. So for example, the way how they slaughter the, the animals can just like uh, filter this, this flow that is then dedicated to countries that are consuming halal meat. So we try to put all this information together to just go a little bit more to the, to the country of production and also identify from where these places are produced. And this is what we do to connect to the impact. So just to summarize all this discussion, this, this information quite clear here, we know the countries that are buying the commodity. Sometimes we know the traders, the importers and the exporters. Kind of like sometimes, and it, this, it depends, quality will depend on the country and the context as well. We know where are the facilities involved in processing this information. And then we want to go a little bit deeper on that to understand where this commodity was produced. And this is how we link to the impacts that we communicate on trades. Deforestation, em emissions, or how, how much of the, the, the companies that are signing zero deforestation commitment are actually linked to areas, sourcing from areas with high uh, rates, deforestation rates. And this brings us to other discussion, which is how we measure the deforestation risk. So we have different ways, and I'm just gonna skip to the next one because it's easier to just show that we try to put information together. So we have satellite information, classified satellite information, they are telling us that the soy is planted in areas recently deforested. And we know that the company is sourcing from this municipality. And in the end of the day, it's very simple math. I'm sorry to disappoint you all, I'm a biologist. So if you have 1,000 tons sourced from this municipality, which has 100 hectares, and if this company is sourcing 50% of it, or 500 tons, we're going to just assign 50% of deforestation to this company. And this is what we call deforestation exposure. So we link this classified satellite information to give us an extension of how much of this deforestation is associated to the expansion of the commodity. We understand the trader sourcing from this specific place, and then we assign part of the responsibility. Yes. So when you say classified, it means like top secret or is it a machine learning? Uh, it would be, it would be, it would be really nicer, but it's just because we have two different ways of uh, spatial information. So you have the satellite data, which is actually just a bunch of pixels with different colors, depending on how you're going to just assemble this information. And you have the classified information, which is someone already went there and interpreted oh. the image. So the interpretation of the image is what we call the classified image. So instead of just having a bunch of pixels with different colors, we know, oh, this is soy, this is deforestation, and them together will create to us the commodity deforestation. That is then later associated to the supply chain for us to understand how much of this deforestation that is happening in Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Colombia, Bolivia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, everywhere in the world is associated to this company's trading to other 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 countries like Sweden or Germany or France or United States or I mean how many countries there are in the world can you stay the rest of it but this is what we do in the end and we have other informations as well to associate to it so what we do is actually we just puzzle maker we just put a lot of information together to understand in the end from the place of production to the country of consumption what are the footprints or what is the the, the, the impact of the products that they're sourced. And now I just want to invite another colleague to talk a little bit about the study case, which is Nishu. Welcome. Just to talk a little bit about how our life can be kind of tricky assembling competition. 
Thank you so much, Vivi, for the great insights and also the fantastic animation. <laughs> so, yes, I'm Nanjiu Su, and I'm a data scientist working in trades for 1.5 years now. And my interest is mostly about data science, economics, and behavior science. Behavior science and also about improving the uh, cooperation in public goods game. For example, if we improve the transparency in the supply chain and deforestation risk behind each actors, how can we improve the cooperation between each countries and each actors to improve the uh, deforestation situation with this now? Yes. And I also love hiking with colleagues. I don't know why it's not a D, but yes. And th those are the reasons why I work in Trace now. So the problem I'm talking about today is about data source change. I believe most of us learned a lot about the algorithms we can use, how to preprocess the data we found online in the university already. And we also kind of have a lot of applications about it. But what we might did not learn a lot in the university is how to update our model, how to maintain our products. So that is one of the problems that I will talk about it today. So we, our trade supply chain data is typically tabular data if you want to download from online. But in fact, how you understand it should be a network. So it's from, okay, which country is import from which importer, from which exporter, through which port, and it goes through which logic card, and where are those products are uh, produced. And those area, the data we got from, for example, the government. Let me give an example in Brazil. So, here, those data we got from Brazil government from a data resource called Com Comics. And then in this part, if we want to link Logistica with the production, then we try to use decision tree and the linear programming to find, to model where the potential state of production for each of the trade flows. However, after, I mean, from 2004 to 2018, we had a map like this. But suddenly, the Brazil government decided to hide some information from us. Yeah, I'm so proud of them. <laughs> and then we do not have the link between the port and logistic hub anymore, which it means we also cannot do decision tree and linear programming and more from here. So half of our map is gone. So that is what we face in the data source change, which we might not face very often in the classes or you know, experiments in the laboratory. So it's like the whole column was missing in the first, in the first graph. Normally, if in the course, we said, oh, what, what do we do for a column? That's with all missing values, which are deleted, right? But in our case, we cannot delete it because this is the core link that we map to the state of production. So what should we do here? I just oversimplified this problem we face, but we just use bas basically two methods. So the first method is we're trying to find some alternative data source, which in our case is the view of lading data, which is created by the carriers and shippers. But the, the problem is that the data quality will be not as good as what the government can provide us, right? So there are a lot of unknown values. So the second thing that we're trying to use models to solve the unknown value problem in those columns. And the model we are using here is the thickness matrix, which is to measure how stable a network between certain nodes is. For example, if exporter one keeps import from the uh, port one, oh, sorry. If, for example, if exporter one keeps import from logic, how one through port one, 
then we would call this link is stable or sticky. And then we will make use it in our recent data to fulfill the column of missing values. Yes, that's just one study case, one problem we faced before and how we solve it in the practical case. And then I believe Thomas, one of my colleagues, will also introduce you another case or the problem we face. Thank you, Matthew. So, thank you all. Um, I'm Thomas, I'm also data scientist in Trace for one and a half year. And I have a, a background in spatial uh, analysis, so GIS things, maps, and what motivates me to be in Trace is basically leading with complex problems and ambiguous data sets because as Nishu just explained, it, it's hard to, to take some decisions on how to map a specific and such an important supply chain. So I will present uh, how we map, or we are uh, beginning in this field of mapping supply chain, and basically how we define supply chain and not the supply chain. And the supply chain is basically the area of, of a company that a company is sourcing from to feed a, a given facility, for instance, so a slaughterhouse, uh, search for different uh, jurisdictions to fed their uh, cattle capacity or soy silos, for instance, where they are sourcing from that soy to fed the, or to fill the, the, the silo or this production facility. So how we map this uh, spatially explicit data and also mixing with tabular data set. So I will start from the end. So here we have a couple of slaughterhouses in Brazil. Uh, we can see Brazil. Nice. Uh, but yeah, imagine that there is a country behind this uh, colorful point. So each point here is a uh, slaughterhouse. And this is something that uh, many traders, such as Cargill, uh, ADM, and financial system and governments wants to see, which is basically the deforestation exposure per uh, slaughterhouse facility or per soy uh, facility, either a silo or a crushing facility. So they can, well, having a, an insight on how to make decisions if they stop uh, buying from a specific facility because they are, well, uh, uh, dealing or also um, allowing a lot of deforestation coming into that um, supply chain. And also because uh, EU due diligence, for instance, that is uh, running in here in Europe to avoid or to, to cut off uh, uh, a deforestation product, uh, that's products associated, associated with deforestation. So this is a super useful information to have that uh, for, well, all these actors. Could you say a little bit more about the EU Due Diligence Act? Uh, this is, again, one of my favorite EU policies recently and when it will go into effect and whether it will actually possibly force the Brazilian government to put those obfuscated links if they want to trade with the EU. Yeah, I, I can talk briefly, I, but basically, uh, well, recently the uh, EU parliament approved that EU due diligence policy, which basically puts a, a cutoff date, which is a date that uh, country production countries would have to stop uh, exporting deforestated associated production. So this date is December of 2019. So after that, uh, the production countries should uh, have a way to disclosure that they are exporting products without deforestation, basically. And Vivi, do you want to comment something about that? I think the only the only thing to add is the huge discussion that they are still having on the responsibilities, and also because it's increased the price of the 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 not for for, for the the companies, they will have to have these MRPs which is the monitoring reporting verification systems. This will also be monitored by the governments, since this is an agreement between the bloc, the European Union and Brazil, and other countries as well. So every, everywhere actually cannot really export place. There's a huge discussion on how to trace this type of thing. And another thing that is included in the due diligence called lot based traceability. So to bear to like to summarize everything, they just threw a lot of words there without really understanding how to monitor it. 
And one of the main concerns is plot-based traceability give us the idea that things are going to be monitored in very high resolution, which most of the commodities are not in a really, really good position to it. So now it's a little bit of like how they're going to understand things in a scenario where we have a lot of indirect sourcing, like, like we, we saw before for, for a lot of different supply chains. Uh, how are you going to monitor that when you don't have satellite images or people are talking about isotopes, for example, which is you have a signature for the grains or for the, the beans or for the beef to know from where they're, they're sourced from. But you also have different levels that the MRV is going to be strict or more permissive depending on the risk, which is actually sourced from an area that is high deforestation. It's going to be more complicated. The problem is countries now are fighting to have like better definitions of areas. So for example, is Brazil the country that is going to be classified as high risk for everything? And then the cocoa sector is pissed about it. So what, what? cocoa in Brazil is actually used for restoration, not for deforestation. How can you just assign high risk to Brazil? But then you look at soy and the situation is completely different, but in the north, not in the south. So you, you still have a lot of discussions on monetary reporting. I mean, what I found quite interesting because they also have this authority to enforce it is that the there was going to there is going to be a mandate as far as I understand that publicly traded commodities should have a geopositional tag, verifiable geopositional tag associated with the commodities, which there are they're making new fields and like financial, you know, um, transactions, right? There's quite a lot of lobby from the so so on this. Yeah. But it's a good goal. It is a good goal. It's very expensive. So field verification and isotopes, which is works like this tag, extremely, extremely expensive, but very feasible in, for example, productions from Spain. Here in Europe is re already a reality because you have the signature in different places of production. But when you talk about the whole tropical area, it's quite tricky. So I think the private companies are starting to realize that satellite images are actually quite cheap when you think about field verification and isotopes. So the problem is set. So we have all these things to solve. And also we need to understand how uh, deforestation and carbon emissions associated to deforestation are related to physical facilities where they're happening in spatial locations uh, in uh, tropical countries. Uh, but for that, so to, to assign a, a deforestation exposure or carbon emission exposure or even a land conflict exposure, uh, to a given facility, we need to, to have a, a supply shed for uh, a given facility. And here, um, well, the point here is uh, a slaughterhouse in Brazil, all the other uh, boundaries, either green or red, are municipalities. So those two here are, the, the left side one is the size of Portugal, for instance. So it's the biggest um, municipality in the world, if I'm not wrong, uh, but it's um, huge. And the distance from this slaughterhouse, the point down there, until that municipality is almost uh, 1,500 kilometers. So that's the average distance that uh, a cattle can be transported in, uh, from a farm uh, to be slaughtered in another state. Uh, so we need to map these things. So we need to understand how the deforestation is happening in these municipalities, in these jurisdictions, uh, to assess the exposure of this uh, facility to, to deforestation. And also we have uh, deforestation maps. So that's how we can assess the deforestation happening in the country. Uh, moreover, we have this uh, important information here, which is uh, the animal shipment guide, transport here, but shipment uh, that we can identify. Well, in, in Brazil, it's mandatory for you, if you're a cattle producer, to, to have a document stating the the quantity of animals, uh, their their age, their uh, is a, uh, either a female or a male from a farm to farm, from a farm to a slaughterhouse, and we can have like many different connections uh, until uh, raising a, a cattle into a slaughterhouse. For instance, here in the top corner, uh, left corner here, <laughs> we can see. Can uh, <laughs> you just getting picked up? Uh, yeah, basically we can see like uh, in. A cattle moving from different municipalities until we reach the, the slaughterhouse here. Uh, and with this data, we can basically assess and uh, build the supply shed. And that's for cattle sector in Brazil. But also, we validate this data, like uh, checking whether uh, the cattle uh, gender is the same that is being slaughtered in that specific slaughterhouse. And we convert everything to 
uh, live animal waves. Uh, so basically we can have like the, the supply shed of beef right here based on volumes per municipality. Uh, moreover, it's not uh, a simple way to get this data. It's kind of publicly available. We have this data from 2015 and 2017, which is millions of rows uh, of data. But now we would like to update this data set like with recent uh, public data, but uh, like for one state, uh, was like how many uh, GTAs for Goiás maybe? Three million. Three million, just for one state for one year? Three, million. Three years. So uh, imagine that we need to, to do that. And now in trace we have available, we will have available in the beginning of next year from 2010 into 2020, uh, three millions, well, we have 27 states in Brazil, and some states produce much more cattle, like 15 millions, uh, like Pará state, or 30 millions. So we need to download everything. But of course, it's not a simple scrapping uh, process. We need to overcome some catch-ups issues. Uh, and that's one of the issues that we are uh, about to face in, in the future, to update this data set and to build more reliable supply sheds on uh, on beef uh, supply chain in Brazil. And that's it for me. And just, I don't know what's next. Can I just do a yeah, Java? Java is when you're just doing kind of like advertising something. Okay. okay. So, presentation. yeah, that's no, it's fine. Okay. So, in Brazil, we built an app. Yes, can I use more triggers? Yeah, yeah. We're just continuing. So, we stop in about three and then people can empty their bladders and chillax and then come back here for discussions. Oh, well, the room. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, Sorry, a bit of a tight schedule, but maybe people want to go to the toilet. Yeah, no, the three minutes, I promise. It's yeah. just, just do some, some, just communicating a little bit. Low. So, Trace also created a spin off, which is called Pasto Prat, and it stands for From Pasture to Plate. It's an app. So, we released this app in Brazil last year. And we're quite excited because it, it's built a, a little bit on what, what Tomas just presented. So people now, they have the possibility to go to the supermarket, scan the beef using the sanitary inspection stamp that is mandatory in the country to have. So we don't really need partnerships with any of these companies. And they can have all the impacts associated to slavery, barn areas, uh, deforestation, and sanitary sanitary fines, which is also related to animal well-being. So they have all this information, but the good thing about it is not only that they can do a more informed decision, but it's also we are here talking about something that it's trace is really about international trade. But this one is a Brazilian net. So we did that because one part of the supply chain that we don't understand in the country is the connection between slaughterhouses and supermarkets. This is something we don't know. We don't know if this Kaipur, for example, is buying from what, what, what group of slaughterhouses. And this is how we can put extra pressure for them to start with more sustainable procurements. The type of information that Thomas just presented, the GTA, it's kind of like the thing that differs for us, like that, that brings us to shitty data, to fantastic data. So when you have the GTA, you really know indirect connections. So for example, again, you're not a cocoa producer anymore. Now you're a beef producer. So I'm buying from you in the early stages of the, the, the animal, and then I'm selling to you, and you're going to sell to the slaughterhouses. For me to buy from you, you need to have a GTA. For me to sell to you, I need to have a GTA. And for you to sell to the slaughterhouse, you need to have a GTA. So we just created the network here. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. So uh, Agas told me that uh, you're going to have kind of like an exercise, the things that you can plan or think that you can do. And scraping this information from the federal government is one of our main, I would say, challenge because it's kind of like it's not, it's not illegal, first thing. But the second important thing is that they increased the requesting time. So now it takes from 11 to 15 seconds to request one GTA. The GTA can be accessed in different ways. You have six numbers that are iterated in, in all the letters in the alphabet, or you can also do that to, using the barcode with these 40 characters. So you can do that, but every single attempt is going to take 15 seconds, or you can see there's another strategy that I don't know. That would be great. Mm. Um, I suppose it's really interesting. Um, it seems you're relying a lot on, on reported data. So it seems like it's 
if it is a legal mandate from the Indian government. Um, and you mentioned 2018. Um, was that because the election then that that changed, or was it something else just back up? It was something else. I mean, kind of. It can be. I mean, that's a huge discussion because we had a the 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 impeachment. It's actually happened. It happened before, but the decision happened after the impeachment. But I wouldn't say that this is associated to the government change. Yeah. So there were kind of like this gray zone. So this all the the rules associated to to this is a bunch of gray zone. So, for example, people were discussing if the GTAs are legally distributed or not, if the case and declaration with all the information was legally uh, public or not. So the companies were putting quite a lot of pressure to hide this information or aggregate this in the municipality level. Because, for example, if I'm Cardew, you are ADM, you're soy, you, you're Coco soy, you are ADM. So you don't really know, you don't want to know that I, you know, you don't want me to know that you're trading with him. And you don't want me to know that you are trading with whom and you're trading with her. So this is the type of thing that you want to hide. And that was pressure from the private sector to hide this information. So they can still claim that it's public, but it's so aggregated that for us brings all this, this problems that Nanshu was describing. The GTA is a different thing. So people started to use this thing and connect with this information for environmental for purpose. But it's actually the GTA was created for sanitary purpose. So now they got very pissed, like, oh, all this data scientists put information together to track the deforestation associated to it. But this was just to check if your animals are have all the vaccines or not. That's the main purpose of this GTA. So that's why it's still public available, but it takes 15 seconds to request, and you need to have the barcode. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like they put extra barriers, and Brazil is going really bad in terms of transparency. I would say that in general, the world in terms of like disclosing this information for trade, for, for a trade, international trade, I go in towards the same direction. So we're losing a little bit of transparency every day. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Vivian, Anshu, and Tomas. Um, I hope uh, you guys um, had a good time. Uh, here's the plan now. So we are going to 